Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, welcome to Christ the King. We are decimated with uh, illness today. Uh, we have no music people. Well, that's not true. Dave is going to help. We're going to sing later. But uh, Beth's sick. The Greens are sick. The Howes are in California. Sick of the weather out there, I'm sure, in San Diego. Oh, I'm sure. And uh, Eddie is sick. I wanted to just talk a little bit about Eddie this morning and uh, the mission in the Sabina. Uh, things are going well over there, and I talked to him this week and and excited about what's what's going on there. Have upwards of 18 kids coming and uh, um, dealing with a lot of kids there in Sabina. Not all of them, but that are troubled, but having an opportunity to reach them for uh, Jesus. So that's good. Uh, but we are here, and uh, we're going to continue our study this morning. And so uh, let's uh, let's pray, and then we'll get started. We do have a studio audience. Uh, it's there, yeah. But anyway, so let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to, to gather like this. And we ask that you would uh, uh, be with us as we look at your word. And we're thankful to you for this opportunity. We pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit would work in our lives and would... Uh, uh, touch lives through this time we spend together. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Uh, we're in we're in Ephesians chapter uh, four, and this, as I have said on a number of occasions, but I'll say it again. This has been one of the most uh, impactful studies on me uh, personally uh, this time through it. Uh, it is such a confidence builder, and we talked last week a little bit about this concept of being a radical Christian, and what is a radical Christian. And it's one who follows Jesus and who's committed to him and who serves him. And in chapter 3, uh, 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3, Paul gives this underlying principle that, uh, that we have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world, and that we've been raised together with him, uh, with Christ. We've been set on the right side of the Father with Christ, all past tense, all done, uh, by God's work, and I think it's summed up very nicely in in Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we have been created, we're like, like God went into his wood shop and he made this beautiful piece of furniture, and it's us. And, uh, and it's all what God has done. And then when we get to chapter 4, it's then, okay, now that this has been done, past tense, completed, what does that mean for us? And last week we looked at the, at the first uh, six verses of chapter 4, and it, and it uses the word, I urge you in verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. In other words, act like you belong to God. We ought to act like we belong. And uh, so, today, the, the title of the, of the message found in, in uh, verses 7 through 16 is that we have been equipped, we've been equipped to serve. And uh, not only have we been created, like it said in Ephesians chapter uh, uh, 2, verses 8 and 9, that we, are, we have been, uh, we are his workmanship, uh, created in Christ Jesus to good works, he, and, and he's saying, you know, now... Walk in a manner worthy of that. Act like, you, act like you belong to Jesus. Act like you're a follower of Jesus. This Jesus following thing is not like, it's not like, okay, I just got a big screen TV and I got me a little Jesus. I got a couple of things in my life. It's more than that. It's an, it's an all-consuming walk with Christ. We talked about last week, 70% of Americans are Christians. But are they? Are 70% Christians? Uh, and the Bible is, is very clear that, that if you're a follower of Jesus, there's a certain uh, demonstration that you're going to have in your life. You are going to show that you are. It's not like, well, I go to church, and we go there on Easter, and we go there on Christmas, and, and I do this, this practice. It's, it's more than that. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a, it's a manner of living. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an abusive, it's not a... Uh, it's not an abusive lifestyle. It's not a bunch of legalistic rules and regulations and, and misery. It's a ball to follow Jesus. It really is. It's a good thing, and it's fun, and it's exciting, 
and it's in comforting and there's nothing um, nothing better than in, in uh, enjoying the the benefits and the results of being being a disciple of Jesus Christ I love the verse in Matthew come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for in this phrase for my yoke is easy and my burden is light while their discipleship and following Jesus certainly requires a commitment and sacrifice it also carries with it an easy burden uh, burden uh, it's a life of of, uh, of joy and peace and contentment so many people in the world are searching so desperately for things and um, and they're not at peace and they turn to alcohol and drugs and sex and and uh, whatever spending money and buying things whatever it is they look for things to bring happiness when in fact uh, there's only one way to have genuine happiness and that is a commitment to Christ so that's what he's talking about and so today he talks we're going to talk about not only have we been called and that we should walk in a manner worthy he has equipped us and we begin in in verse uh, 7 but the grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift uh, the grace was given to to us according to the measure of Christ's gift therefore it says and this is a quote from Psalm 68, verse 18. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I was studying this this week, I wasn't quite sure what this meant. And I'm going to explain what I think it means, but, uh, uh, but you may have a different view on this. But here's what I think, because he goes on to say in verse 9, he explains it. He says, in saying he ascended... What does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? And he who, des is, who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And here's what I think it means. First of all, this quote from Psalm 68, verse 18, is not an exact quote. It's kind of a paraphrase. Uh, I paraphrase all the time, right, when I stand up here. I'll say, well, the Bible says this, and I'll paraphrase it. I've kind of put it in my own words. And Paul sort of does this here. And when I first was studying this, I thought, well, how does this all fit into the scheme of what he's writing? And in his explanation in verse 9 uh, and, and verse 10, I think this is what he's saying. When you, when you see, when you think about this, the incarnation of Christ, what was the incarnation of Christ? That big word, what does that mean? Incarnation. What did Jesus do on December 25th, supposedly? Uh, it probably wasn't December 25th, but what happened? He became human. He became, he became uh, God became man and dwelt among us. One of the great mysteries of the Bible. Uh, and, and Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the hum universe, was then held by his mama, right? Nursed by his mama and raised as a little boy, uh, became an adolescent, and grew up 30 years of age he begins his public ministry and then for 30 uh, for three years he performs miracles and he does all of it. he preaches the the kingdom of God and in the end he is uh, crucified buried rises again a few days uh, a few weeks later he ascends into heaven and one of the things he tells his disciples uh, is that I have to go away and one of the reasons I have to go away is that I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit and so you think about it Jesus in his uh, in his human form was uh, just like us he was limited in where he was and uh, think I uh, think about this and we went through John think about what it was for the disciples uh, to be able to see all this and experience all this but what happened was and he told him he said you know if I don't go away I can't send you the Holy Spirit and when the Holy Spirit comes, then things are really going to begin to happen. And I think that's what he's talking about here, based upon as he moves into the next section. And so, while it would have been fun to walk with Jesus, I would love to see him and shake his hand. Wouldn't you? Comes up to you at work. Hi. You know it's him. Shake his hand. Uh, I've never seen him. I don't know what he looks like. Uh, one day we'll see him, and we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. Uh, but we... But, but his leaving has come the Holy Spirit. And I think, and, and this is one of the things that, that really jumped out at me as we began Ephesians, is that 
So many times we as followers of Christ feel so inadequate in, in our life, and we feel so powerless, and we feel insignificant, when in fact we shouldn't. We shouldn't, because we've been, we have been uh, transformed, God has given us the Holy Spirit, and in our growing process, we need to grasp a hold of that. And so I think that's what he's saying there. He who ascended, verse 10, is the one who uh, ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so he has gifted us. And I'm gonna, I got a PowerPoint today. First time in a long time. One screen. Oh, no. You, you got to start over because I've got to do this right. And we're going to look at this next little section here. And he gave the apostles. He gave the apostles. So I'll do this, right? We good? We're dead. Did I do something wrong? Okay. Chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles. And he gave. And this, uh, what I've got up here is from uh, an adaption. And I did some things on my own um, from a book. The Permanent Revolution by Alan Hirsch and uh, Tim uh, Katchim. And, uh, and so we're going to look at these five things he mentions here. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Now, in the past, I was of the opinion that the apostles and the prophets were, were no longer in effect today. That that was during the church age, and it was like Paul and uh, Peter and James and John... And, and all of that, and the prophets, you know, we don't really have prophets today. Uh, we do have evangelists, uh, and primarily uh, leaders of churches are called what? Pastors. And so pastors and, and teachers. Well, I've transitioned from that belief. I, I believe that these are active today. These five uh, positions are active today. And I also believe that they're more than just official positions. I believe they are giftings, and we're going to look at that in a little bit here. Uh, they're giftings, and and in, in, in equipping uh, the church to do the work of the ministry. And the first one is the apostle, and the apostle uh, <coughs> is the visionary. I think there's a difference between a big A apostle. Who's the, what's a big A apostle? That's Peter, James, and John. And a little a apostle. And it's a gifting. Is it an office? Perhaps. But it's more of a gifting. It's an, it's an apostle. And an apostle is a visionary. And, and I'm going to go through these five and uh, give you one word to describe what each one of them is. And then we're going to talk about uh, the downside to each position. Because there's a downside to each position. But the apostle is the visionary. He's the big picture. He thinks outside the box. He, he's the dreamer. She's the dreamer. I, I don't think it's a gender thing. This gifting uh, is a is a is a is a dreamer is a uh, visionary. Then you have the prophet. The prophet is the protector. He's the one that is the uh, uh, he or she is the one that has this. If you have this gifting, you're the one that you know is the guardrails to the visionary. Uh, the guardrails. We need guardrails, right? What does the visionary do? You know what? Let's go climb Mount Everest next Monday. Well, you know, we might ought to think about that. Might not be something we're going to do next Monday. Uh, but the prophet is one uh, who is the, the guardrail. You know, we think of a prophet as doing what? Telling the few, foretelling the future. But when you look at the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah through Malachi, you see that most of what they were, they, were, they, did, they did tell the future. They did make uh, prophecies. But most of them were doing what? They were giving a message from God to the people. Uh, and it was it was often a, a message of warning. It was a message of hey, you better wake up and change. Uh, the, the perfect example is Jonah, the story of Jonah that we're pretty much all fulfill, uh, familiar with. What did God tell Jonah? Go to Nineveh, warn them that if they don't straighten out, I'm going to judge them. So Jonah he, he doesn't want to go. He ends up in, in, in the belly of the fish. Ultimately goes back, and what happens? The Ninevites repent. That, that is most of what prophets do. The next one is the evangelist. We're good? He's the recruiter. He or she's the recruiter. We think of the evangelist as uh, thinking about... Uh, the evangelist is one who... Uh, he or she is one who shares the gospel. We think of that primarily. But really the gifting is one that are recruiting people to the cause. 
They're the ones. They're they're out there recruiting, recruiting people to salvation, recruiting people. Uh, maybe you don't like that word, but it fits for me. Okay, recruiter sounds like you're getting people to come work for you or something. But uh, they have this desire to have people join. Then you have the the uh, shepherd or the pastor. They, they're the nurturer. They're the ones that 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 care for people, that, that want to heal wounds and want to uh, take care of them and put their arms around them and love them. And then the ultimately the uh, teacher is the educator. He's the, he or she is the one who studies the Word of God and is able to, to share insight uh, in, in the, uh, from Scripture. To me, this is a beautiful picture of how a church works. These five giftings. You have the visionary who gets the big picture. You have the prophet person who is the one that is the guardrails. Okay, the, your vision is good, but we need to be careful and we need to, we need to follow what, uh, uh, follow what is, is uh, in harmony with God and with his word. Then you have the recruiter who says, come on, join, join. You would be a part of us. And, and, uh, and again, I think it's primarily uh, used in the scripture of uh, uh, sharing the gospel. You know, you, the, in the old days, they had the traveling evangelists who come into town, set up the tent, and preach the gospel. And, uh, but it's more than that. And then you have the, the shepherd. We all need to be loved. So they're the ones concerned with the, with the nurturing. And then finally, the teacher, who is the one who is, gets deep into the word and teaches the word of God. And then the result of that is to do what? Equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, every one of these five has a weakness. Uh, and that's what makes it beautiful. Because the weakness of each position is seen in the strength of another position. And so you have this tremendous harmony of the gifting within the church that enables us to do what? And we'll look at this in a minute, but grow up to maturity. So what's the weakness of the uh, visionary? He tends to, he could, he or she could have a vision that, that is kind of wackadoodle. And it's like, well, let's climb Mount Everest next Monday. Well, first of all, none of us are in shape to do it, right? And we got, we're, we, got a, we got passports that we got to get and all of that. It's not happening next Monday. Uh, the prophet is the guardrail. What's the downside to the prophet? You think? The prophet is a procedure person, a policy person. You know, this is the way we've got to do it. This is the way we've got to do it. I hear the guardrails. But what's wrong with a policy person? They can become legalistic, right? And so, and again, I will say this, there's not one of these that's more important than the other. They're all the same. They work together. So the, so the policy person is the one who, uh, this is the policy. Uh, the, the, uh, the Pharisees had a Sabbath policy, right? Can't heal on the Sabbath. But the dude's been a cripple for 38 years. And I'm willing to heal him, and he can walk. We have a policy here. And uh, we were at the prison yesterday visiting Eddie. And uh, you go into a room, it's about as big as this room here, maybe a little bigger. You sit at a table, and you wait, and then they, they, Eddie comes in through the door, and there's a guard sitting up there watching everything go on. And, uh, and they have a, a guy that comes in, uh, there, since we've been going there since 2014, been two different inmates that come in and take pictures. Some of you have seen the pictures of uh, Eddie and, and uh, me and Beth and Diane and Presley when they were there. It's an inmate. He comes in, he sets up over in the corner, and you buy the little ticket out in the foyer uh, so you can get the uh, picture made. So you come in, he sits there, and, and both uh, inmates over these last few years have been bigger than life personalities, big smile on their face, you know, and how you doing? And in the past, I have uh, gone to the uh, garden, said, uh, can I buy them a Pepsi or a Coke? Because you have to go buy it in the vendor because they don't get those. 
And until yesterday, the guard has always said, uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. But yesterday, had a policy guy. So you can't do that. It's against the policy. Okay, it's against the policy. I mean, I understand that, but I'm buying the guy Coke. And, uh, but so that's, that's the downside to the, to the prophet. Then we have the recruiter. What's the downside to the evangelist? Uh, not in sharing the gospel, but in the concept of recruiting. Well, I'll share it with you, what I think it is. Uh, avoids red flags, invites people in, gets them involved. And I, uh, I was guilty of this uh, many years ago in my first church where I had a guy come and, boy, he sounded like he just wanted to serve the Lord. And, and I just, he had gone through a tough time in his former church and he's critical of his former church, which, by the way, when you, somebody comes to you and complains about every church they've been in, guess what's going to happen? They're going to complain about us, too. And I knew that, and I, uh, but I so wanted him to come, and I, rec I'm a, I happen to uh, uh, believe that I'm an apostolic evangelist, big vision guy, uh, recruiter, come, be a part, I'll give you the store, and then what happens down the road? It blew up in my face and caused me all kinds of heartache because I avoided the red flags. But the recruiter doesn't care because you just come in. And I had a guy in that church who was, I think, probably had the, the prophet gift who warned me, and I'm going to tell you, you're making a mistake. And I just said, nah, it's a personality thing with you. You know, you just need to get along. It's a personality thing. No, he was warning me, and I should have listened. So, and then, and then the shepherd. What's the downside to the nurturer? Cares too much. Cares too much? Cares too much? So how can you care too much? They become enablers. Become enablers, yeah. 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 Care too much is good. Uh, I was talking to Beth about this yesterday when she was planning to be here, and she pointed out the care too much and the enabler. You know, they care about people. And so you enable them, and you make excuses for them. And... Uh, uh, you know, you say, well, you know, they are this or they're that and, and all that. Um, and, 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 you, and you can become burnt out. You want to change people, right? You see people who are, who are struggling uh, and you want to change them. And sometimes you can't. So that's the downside. And then the teacher. What's the downside to the educator? Thinks everybody can be taught. Thinks everybody can be taught, yeah. Or wants to be taught. Or wants to be taught, yeah, that's good. They can get a big head because they think they know more than they others. They can get a big head because they think they, and they do maybe know more than others, and that goes to their head, yeah. Uh, and I would also say that they become the academics. They become the ivory tower people who, you know, I, I understand the scriptures, and they lose sight of the fact that the scriptures are really meant for ordinary people. And they look at people who don't quite get it as quite getting, quite getting it. And they're kind of beneath them because of their knowledge. Now those are the downside. But you think about how this all works in harmony. How does it all work in harmony? You have the visionary who sets the vision. You have the, the, the prophet person who is the guardrail thing. He, uh, they are also involved in, you know, we have to have justice. And we have to we have to do this, and they're kind of they could be kind of rigid, and so the visionary goes, okay, you're rigid, and the and the prophet person goes, okay, I see that, still interested in policy, but I see what you're saying. The recruiter goes, okay, yeah, you're right, there are red flags, not everybody fits, not everybody can be a part of this. Uh, the shepherd goes, yeah, I care for these people, but I understand uh, that I'm enabling. And then the teacher goes, who's, who's deep into the Word of God and, and really does know stuff and learn things, begin to go, yeah, you know what? The Word of God is practical for truck drivers. You don't have to be an academic or for, or for, uh, for just ordinary people. You know? So isn't that beautiful, how these five work together? And so the gifting then becomes um, these, gift, these five gifting areas make for what? To equip the saints for uh, 
trying to find it here. For the work of the ministry. And then, what, what does it say next? And you can go back to the text. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up of the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? It's all believers, right? But it's, it's also in a local setting, it's us. We are the local body of Christ, uh, and, and every church uh, is that as they, as they honor, as they follow Christ. For the building of the body of Christ, until we may all attain to the unity of the faith, there we see that concept of unity, the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood or womanhood. What's the goal of a church? To be mature. You know, I, uh, when, when uh, Beth and I went through our rough times years and years ago, we went to a counselor, and the counselor talked about our childhood. You know, what had gone wrong in our childhood. Well, whose childhood has ever been perfect? Anybody here had a perfect childhood? And I had another wise counselor who said, he said, you know what the purpose of childhood is? To grow up. That's the purpose of childhood, and to mature. And, and that's the same way with us. Our purpose in, our, in, our, in this endeavor that we have as Christ the King Wilmington is to become mature, to mature, uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cutting, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. I'm not going to get through this today because there's a whole bunch in that I want to talk about. Um, but uh, let me just, uh, let me, and I'm gonna, I'll read the next section. We'll come back to this next week. But I want to open it up and see if you have any comments you want to make. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body and joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds its, uh, itself up in love. You got the pro apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, shepherds, teachers, to equip us to do the work of the ministry for what? Together, as CTK Wilmington, to do what? To mature, to grow up. And what is the result of that maturity? That we might attain unity in spite of our personality differences. And the fact every one of us has a certain weirdness about us, right? We overcome that, we become unity. Why do we become unified in Christ? Because we mature. And we see that the things that we argue over a lot of times are unimportant. So we become, uh, we become uh, unified in the no and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And, I, and, and Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the, uh, and the fellowship of his suffering. I, talk, I, want to know, I want to know Jesus. I don't want to know about him. I want to know him. And that is a part of what we do. Uh, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about every wind of doctrine. And I'm going to come back to that. But here's the point. Here's the thing that we have to really understand. There are false teachers out there <coughs> who may be smooth, uh, who may have a big personality, and may look like they have a very successful ministry. And I'm not being critical of all of that, but just because somebody appears to be smooth and have it all together does not mean that they are a, uh, a true teacher. In fact, I, will, I would tell you this, just because someone stands up here and teaches you the Word of God, it doesn't mean you should swallow it hook, line, and sinker, even when I do it. Now, I try to study the Bible and teach it and understand it and share it with you, but it's not true because I did it. It's not true because I say it. It's true because uh, if it, if it uh, is in harmony with Scripture. I heard, uh, I don't know if they do it anymore with all computer technology and all that stuff they have, but they used to talk about how did they, how did they uh, determine whether a uh, $100 bill is genuine or not. And the experts that do that 
they don't focus on the false ones. They know the original, the real deal so much that they can pick out the falsehood. And that's the way it is with us. Uh, this book is the foundation of what we believe, right? Uh, I've had people say, well, you know, God, uh, God, uh, God speaks to me. And, well, that's great, but what's he telling you? Is it, is it in harmony with this? And, uh, and he, he says in this passage that we should not be children tossed to and fro. We ought to have confidence. And uh, I want to come back to that next week because it's a, we've been at it about 30, 35 minutes. And so, right? About that. And uh, that's what we usually do. But I'm going to come back and we're going to do this again. But are there any, any questions on the apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, shepherds, teachers? I get them in the wrong order. Any comments or questions? By the way, I have an assessment test that some of you have taken that will help you find uh, maybe the areas of your gifting in this area. If you'd be interested, um, I will uh, open that up for you. Now it costs, it won't cost you anything. The only reason I mention it costs is that if I send you an invitation, I really would like you to do it because I'm paying for it, okay? so. Uh, but and some of you've taken it and uh, and then I get a report on what you are and and uh, and it I think it's pretty accurate those of you that have taken it right uh, I was an apostle and evangelist so I was yeah. a visionary which is so true he's right I'm yeah. the let's clap my let's, let's right. go to Mount Everest next week let's right. just do it and then yeah. the and, the, and the important thing on this whole thing is that it's not one is better than the other. Mm -mm. The visionary who wants to climb Mount Everest on Monday, who's shut down by the prophet, we have one prophet over on that side of the room, who is shut down by the prophet, is, is not legitimate to say, you're just an old stick in the mud for not catching my vision because I'm smarter than you. Uh, but it's a, it's a working together. Uh, the shepherd, the teacher, teaches the word of God, and so it becomes this this thing and like uh, this uh, harmonious thing and like I said I do believe there's offices uh, that uh, these people are but I think it's far more than that uh, I do not want you to call me Apostle Paul or even Pastor Paul really Paul is good enough so I'm not big into titles but to me it's a beautiful thing any other uh, comments or questions or Okay, well, we're going to pray and say goodbye to Facebook. And since our musicians are not gone, are all gone because of various and sundry illnesses and situations, uh, when we're done, we're going to sing because David's, we're going to sing anyway. So anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we've spent together. Thank you for this word. And we just pray your blessing uh, upon us this day. Be with all of our people who are ill or traveling or... Uh, uh, wherever they are, we ask your blessing upon them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.